Well, good morning, church. If you have your Bibles and you've been with us a while, you will know that we're in 1 Corinthians. If you are new, welcome. We're glad you're here with us. You can turn to the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Before we actually get into this morning's message, there's a couple things that I want to bring to your attention. The first is this connection card. This is a great way for us to not only get to know you a little bit better, but on the back, we really want to see what God is doing in your life. If there are prayer requests that you have, please write them down because we as staff and elders, we do pray over these with you, giving you air support all week long. So we would love to know what's going on, but we also want to see some God sightings. Where is God at work in your life? Are you opening your eyes to see what God has been up to? So please fill those out. The second thing is we're getting very close, very close to finishing the the new building. All right, so how many, yeah, 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 let's <laughs> go. Our children's ministry can't wait to get in there. All the Bible studies and life groups can't wait to get into the kitchen to use it. And there's a lot of mission opportunities that we have in our community that are going to be blessed by that addition. Well, so after or between services, the elders are going to be in the new addition. The doors will be open. You can go and walk, and they'll give you a little tour. But we are also looking for a housewarming gift. So if you look at this sheet that's in your connection car, or in your bulletin, you'll notice on the back there are wish lists that we would like to see happen in some of these classrooms and in the, in the foyer and things like that. So if you're feeling to go a little bit beyond what your normal giving is and you're like, man, you know what, I want to bless the children's department with this, feel free. You will notice some of those things in the new building, and the elders will kind of help point you in the right direction on that level. But in order to get this all buttoned up and completed, we need to accomplish some of those things. So I know a lot of you have. If you've been here a long time, you've been donating generously to get the building completed. But if you're new and you're kind of just looking for another way to, to give and serve, that is another opportunity for you. So feel free to do so. All right. Now, we are going to talk truth today. And we're going to start off by seeing how divided we are as a congregation. How many of you have already put up your Christmas tree and decorations? Raise your hands. Raise them high. Be confident. How many of you are like, what are you doing? (laughs) Okay. All right. So we are a little divided this morning. I applaud those that have actually put their Christmas tree up. I usually put mine up like Halloween. And I do it because I'm not a big Halloween fan, but I love Christmas. I just love the lights. I love the music. I actually start listening to Christmas music, especially when we lived in California, about June, July. Because it's a great way to get us through the heat of the summer to uh, show us that there might be a season change coming soon. But I love Christmas music, and, and I can't wait to celebrate Thanksgiving and Christmas with you as a family. All right, bow your heads and close your eyes. Let's pray. Glorious Father, we are here today to lift your name on high. And Father, there is not one passage of Scripture that we can get through without being challenged. So Father, I pray that your Scripture will challenge us where we're sitting. May you speak clearly. May we understand that we are one body, baptized by one Spirit, For one Jesus, take us away from divisions. Help us to realize the gifts that you've given us. We all work together for unity's sake. In Christ's name, amen. Now I want to start off by thanking Pastor PJ, Jason, and Stephen for preaching the last number of weeks and leading us in God's Word. It's kind of been a whirlwind couple weeks for us and our family. A dear brother of mine passed away two weekends ago, or three weeks ago. And so uh, two Sundays ago, we were in California doing his memorial service, and that was a really difficult situation. And then last Sunday, our son got married, and so it's been kind of like a a death and then a life. It's been a real weird, emotional couple weeks, but we are glad to be back, and I know you were blessed by um, those men preaching the truth. Now, how many of you, if you look in the mirror in the morning, or maybe in the middle of the day, or maybe even in the evening, or maybe you just don't look in the mirror at all, But how many of you, when you do look in the mirror, there's something on your body or about your body that you wish you could change? (laughs) Raise your hand if, okay. When you look in the mirror, do you see the beautiful creation that God created? 
or do you see something that has maybe some flaws, things that you would like to change, things that you might want to get rid of, maybe tuck in a little bit, cut back, fine tune. Maybe looking in the mirror kind of just makes us a little bit more insecure. Well, Matthew chapter 22, 37 and 39, and he said to him, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's kind of an interesting phrase, terminology, wording. Like for most of us that are Christ followers, we're going, absolutely, I can love the Lord God with all my heart, mind, body, and soul. The second one is a little bit more difficult because then we have to understand who is our neighbor, who is Jesus talking about as our neighbor. He would say everybody is our neighbor, including our enemies. Uh Uh-oh. And then we have to love them like we love ourselves. Uh-oh. What does this mean? Love yourself? Does this mean that you have to be content with the way God created you? Because he made us perfect in his image? Does this mean that we cannot love others the way God wants us until we love ourselves? Can we even love God with our whole heart, mind, body, and soul if we can't love others and also love ourselves? See, church, what we have here, and this has been a non-going problem since the fall of humanity, is we have an image problem. We have an image problem. And it stems from the sin of humanity. And what Paul has been correcting the Corinthian church so far in the last 12 chapters, he has been challenging them in a variety of different ways. He's been challenging them in their marriages. He's been challenging them in their celibacy. He's been challenging them in their lusts of the flesh, suing one another, being able to humble themselves, stop comparing and contrasting, thinking one is better than the other, and the one that's lower is not as good as the one that's a little bit more well-to-do in life. He's been challenging the church in a variety of different ways for a big purpose. And Paul laid down all this groundwork to get the church to become unified around Christ, not around what we look like, not around just our gift mix, not around who's doing what and who's not doing something. Because with all this groundwork, we are not able to understand what Paul is actually trying to say. So now that he's opening, uh, continuing in his letter in this particular aspect, it stems from a heart issue of the people in the church. Now, I've, I've said this before, and people have said this to me as well. The greatest thing about the church is the people, and the hardest thing about the church is the people. And you would notice this, that even with Christmas decorations, we are semi-divided. So you can imagine when we dig a little bit deeper into some of our entrenches, we have issues. It's really hard to understand unity, the way Paul is trying to address unity, if we can't understand our flaws. He has been letting every believer know that each one of them has spiritual gifts, and that's what Stephen was talking about last week, that all those gifts are important. It's not one is better than the other. And unfortunately, when we receive gifts, God gives gifts depending on what he sees in your life. Some of you have many gifts. Some of you have one or two. Some of you have one. And it's really hard for us to not get upset about that. Because we view some gifts as better than other gifts. And so Paul is addressing this. We have people cutting down others because they believe their gifts are better. And we have some not liking their gifts that they have been given by God because they want other people's gifts. They want to receive what other people have gifts. So turn in your Bibles. Here we go. Chapter 12. And uh, we're going to start in verse 12. And let's see if any of us need to be challenged this morning. I don't want you to look at your neighbor and go, yeah, man, you really got to pay attention to this because you've got a problem. I want you to read the Scripture and allow the Spirit of God to speak to you first. It says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. Verse 13, you can highlight this and, and just leave today memorizing this. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Jew or Greek, slave or free. And all were made to drink of one spirit. That's the bulk of what Paul's trying to say. Verse 14. For the body does not consist of the one member but of many. 
If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body. Who did? Who? God. Oh, interesting. God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. So what this should tell you is that he chose the church to all be different. And a lot of us are different. We are different people. And God did it that way for his purposes. So let's understand this this morning. Verse 19. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with great modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part of the Uh, that lacked it that there may be no division please underline that phrase there will be no division in the body but that the many members may have the same care for one another if one member suffers all suffer together if one member is honored all rejoice together now you are the body of christ and individually members of it and god has appointed in the church first apostles second prophets third teachers then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts. And I will show you a still more excellent way. Now, not to make it gross, but now that we've been talking about the body for this long, I'm going to actually talk about our body. When we go and have a shower... Whether you have a shower after the gym or maybe before you go to bed, you have to decide how much of my body am I going to wash with soap. Now, having three men in our house when they were younger, they would be in there quick. And I'd be like, what are you doing? And they're like, well, I washed the main parts. And I'm like, I'm thankful. But the problem is when you don't wash all of it, there's still an aspect of you that stinks. So even though you clean some, when you come out, you still smell. So get back in and clean the entire body. This is a unity thing, okay? So we even go and have showers that way. Well, these parts are a little bit more important than those parts, and so we only wash some parts and leave the other ones unclean. Problem. The whole body needs to be clean, right? Well, guess what, church? The entire body needs to be in unity. And it means no division. And he's talking about spiritual gifts, but he's even going in deeper into diversity. So number one on your notes is unity by one body. Now, Paul is using this imagery for a reason because this is an imagery that many people in his culture used. And we often confuse unity with uniformity. Because it is much easier to gather with people who are like ourselves than it is to reach across devices or divisions which mark our culture. So what we do is, if we don't like the people around us, or they make us feel insecure, or whatever, we don't want to be around them. We want to be around people that make us feel secure. Well, we take this into the church. We do not want to be around people that think differently than us, that act differently than us, that vote differently than us, that school differently than us, that celebrate Christmas a little earlier than some of us. We don't like that. So what we do is we go, I want to go to that church that looks, smells, and feels like me. What's the problem? The heart is the problem. Why are we going? Is it because God actually told us to go? Or is it because we just don't like what's going on? So we are going to separate ourselves and move over here. He has a problem with that. Paul has a problem with that. Jesus has a problem with that. And quite honestly, we should have a problem with that. 
Few of our churches even reflect. Few churches even reflect the ethnic, social, and economic diversity of the neighborhoods that they were planted in. And, and you, don't, you, you can leave Puyallup and go and experience this. In the NAB, our denomination, they've actually had to close down churches because the community around them had built up and they didn't reach out to the community. And so everyone else changed around them and they stuck in the same spot without even a desire to go out and witness to a culture that needs it. And so what do we do? Then we, we start seeing churches shrink. And then sometimes we end up seeing churches shut down. And that is never a healthy thing. So what is Paul getting at? Paul is now using the physical body as the image of the communal reality that is not just unique to Paul. Paul was not the first person to use this analogy. In fact, the Roman-led community, the world around them at this particular time, especially politicians and philosophers, used the body as the image for them to push their, their, their legislation, to push their leadership on their community. Most often, it was used to support a social hierarchy. So in the home as a family, the head of the home, of the body, leads the rest of the body, right? The city, the empire as a whole, we are Rome, we lead you, you follow and do what we tell you to. The point was that everybody needs a head with that visual analogy, and in a society that was provided mostly by wealthy, the rulers and the elite, they were viewed as the head, and everyone else that was an elite and was poor or a slave was the body fulfilling everything so that the head could be puffed up. Kind of sounds very similar to our society. Amen. Some things don't change. And so what does Paul do? Paul actually takes this and puts it in another direction. He's drawing the same imagery, but he's talking about the unity of the body. He does not, in fact, mean that the less honored members get abused or treated roughly or poorly. Because what was happening is in the Corinthian church is they were going, the wealthy were up here, the poor were down here. The Jews were up here, the Greeks were down here. The slaves were down here, the free were up here. Right? So what does Paul do? He says, all parts belong to one another. Therefore, the weaker parts that culture would view are treated with special care. And quite frankly, the foundation of America was wrapped around that process. It was everyone gets to play. Everyone has a voice. Together, we are unified and we can actually make a better society. So the end result of the body metaphor in Paul's hands here is not the same old hierarchy where people on the top dominate the lesser important ones, but that each part is cared for by all the others. Who would have thought that's where he was headed? The problem is we take the imagery of the body and funnel it through the same Roman Empire context into today. We put pastor, preaching gifts, leadership gifts, uh, wisdom gifts, all the way up here, and then the helps and the givers and the administrators are down here. So we've basically taken a cultural thing and brought it into the church. And then we wonder why we have a problem. We focus on the important gifts of leadership gifts and barely talk about any of the other ones in church. And then, as we do this in the church, we wonder why we have pastors on pedestals. We created that. We did that. We hijacked what God's intention was for his people and said, you know what? I like those gifts better, so let's make those more important. Those ones are good. They help make the church function, but those ones are a little bit less. We have complexes. Then we have churches vying for power and authority. And then it's like, well, we have bigger budgets over here because they obviously are, are stronger in these other gifts. So it becomes, my church is better than your church, or my pastor is better than your pastor, my children's ministry is better than your children's ministry, our worship is better than your worship, or our preacher is better than your preacher because he writes books, has podcasts, and is more easy to listen to. 
Like how many church conferences do we go to with no-name people? Those don't sell tickets. They don't sell tickets because like who wants to go to that conference where that pastor has like 25 people? So what do we do? Oh, we need the name. We need the name. They got to write a book. They got to have a podcast. They got to have a following on Twitter. They got to have everything. That's who we're going to go pay to see because obviously something has happened with them and their leadership style that we need to glean from and take it back to our church so that we can become that. What in the world is going on? And so then we wonder what in the world when a pastor falls or when a pastor leaves, what are we going to do as a church? Our preacher is gone. Our leader is gone. Now, I'm not saying I'm up here saying that I've never had these emotions and these feelings before, okay? Like, I understand these emotions and these feelings are true. But what Paul, if you go all the way back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2, he goes, some say Cephas, some say Paul, some say Apollos. He goes, no, 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 no. It's not about picking and choosing who you want to be with. It's about Christ. One God, one spirit, one baptism, right? So I'll be honest, this morning, if, 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 this is, if we're going to act this way, if I were to leave here, the church of Christ's community, sh- community should continue. And continue, uh, continue spreading the gospel and seeing people come to the Lord and reaching the community. And you know what? The last three weeks should show us that. Jason could preach too. PJ could preach too. Stephen could preach too. So thank you, Lord for giving us gifts that all rally together, but not one gift is better than the other. Okay, number two on your notes. The weaker have a part to play. Now, the word weak, Paul is using the word weak here because in the cultural uh, sense of Corinth is the wealthy were the strong and the weak were the poor. The Jew were the strong, the Greek were the weak. So what is he talking about here? There is an inversion happening around the word weak. For instance, in our culture, we want the weak members of our physical body and features to change. If we go back to the opening question about when you look in the mirror, is there anything you want changed? We all want something to change. But we still need it. It makes up our body. Right? The theme of weakness in Corinthians here has basic social and economic dimensions. Paul reminds the church that God has called Mainly the weaker of the world, not the so-called strong. Remember that. Those that think they are strong are actually weak. Those that think they are weak are actually made strong through Christ. So the weak that Paul is talking about were considered those without status. Or those with the smaller gifts. In 1 Corinthians 1, 26-27, it talks about that, rather than the noble born and the powerful. So here you have this new church rallying around Christ, and they're divided because some are wealthy and some are poor, some are free, some are slaves. And yet God brought them all together to wrap them around Christ, not to make it about them. But it doesn't take long for humanity to ignore Christ and bring it back to make it about them. That's a problem. So contrary to most translations in 1 Corinthians 1.25, it does not talk about the weaknesses of God, but it actually talks about the weak thing of God. And if you were to go back to that verse, what it's talking about is the cross. When it, when it says the weak thing of God, it's talking about the cross. The cross is weak to the world. To us, it's strong. We rally around the cross. That's why we come. Sanctification, salvation comes by the weakness of the cross. The reason why it was considered weak is because that was the weakest way to die in their culture. Like other people wanted a noble death. The cross was not noble, right? So even Jesus dying on the cross was viewed as weakness because it was the lowest way to die. However, Jesus chose this as an example of how the world's view, he seemed weak, but three days later, he was made strong through resurrection. 
So even through the act of the cross, the world views that as weak. We view that as strong. So could it be that Paul is trying to address the church to go, if you think you're strong, you're really weak. And if you think you're weak, you could be strong based off of Christ. 2 Corinthians 12.9 would tell us, He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So what you might view as weak, wow, he might actually make it strong. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So once again, this is Paul addressing the Corinthian church in a second letter to let them know that, hey, you know what? You might view that person as weak, but in in God's eyes, they're strong. So in the Corinthian church, the weak were, in fact, being despised and shamed by some of the others. We read that in chapter 11. So you got these hierarchy people as the head, and they're going, I don't need the arm. That's weak. I don't need the foot. I definitely don't need the ear. If you want to go be an ear, go be an ear. We don't need you here. Jesus called the church to a better way of life. And he did this actually many years earlier when he was with his disciples. His disciples were arguing about who's going to have the higher authority when they get to heaven, if you remember that. And what did Jesus say? First is last, last is first. Now how many of you, when you're in the Costco line or Safeway line, you view that? No, if you're last, you're going, oh man, these lines stink. And then the person that's right there by the cash register, you're like, oh, I wish I were them. Well, in God's eyes, through the lens of Christ, he would say, first is last, last is first. And I know he's talking about eternity here. But it still is hard for us as human beings to wrap our mind around this. See, differences within the church are astonishingly something that God has arranged. God arranged it this way. God made everyone in the church completely different. He did that. So if you want to be mad at something, you could be mad at God. I don't recommend doing it. But he created the church to be different and diverse. And he did it for a reason. Therefore, the diversity within the church community is not something to be tolerated or regretted or manipulated for one's own advantage, but something to be received as a gift by God. And unfortunately, when we start putting other spiritual gifts more important than others, what that does is it puffs up the head of humanity. And then humans take that puffed upness and they go, you know what, I need a bunch of help gifts in order to make me grow. It's dangerous. So Paul's argument implies that not only diversity but unity in that diversity is a reality without which the church cannot live. Did you know the church cannot survive in one way of thinking? The church cannot survive with only one spiritual gift. It can't survive. God didn't create the church that way. God's church is built for unity through diversity. And Paul is insisting on something richer, something greater, since the church is intended to be a foretaste of the final reconciliation of all things that God has promised, Paul calls the church to start acting that way. This diversity within the church is not a problem to be avoided or solved or managed, but a gift of God's grace and a sign of the Spirit of God at work. So you know what? Thank goodness we don't all see eye to eye on secondary issues. Thank God. But we don't thank God. We get agitated. And we go, well, there's got to be another church out there that's going to think like me. Okay, go. But that's dangerous to do that because you're going with an an issue in your heart. And all you're doing is taking that heart issue to the next church. That's not healthy. He called us unity around diversity. Remember what Matthew said in Matthew 22 in the opening verse, You shall love the Lord God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, if this is to be true, we cannot love the Lord God with all our heart, our soul, and our mind if we're going to fight with the other members of our body and not love them for who God has made them to be. 
So instead of fighting with the person, go, thank you, God, for making them that way. And I know this is hard. Right? Because usually we try to pray that person out. Like, God, please, please save me from my stress. Get them out of our church because I really like it here. Oof. I think I've prayed a few of those prayers before in my life too. Church, what Paul is trying to do is he's trying to say, let's celebrate our differences. Can we celebrate our differences as a church? Not fight over our differences because what does that do? It takes our eyes off the gospel. If Satan could get us in fighting, we are of no effort for Christ in the gospel. We need to celebrate our differences, not neglect them. Not divide over them, not separate because of them. Look at what Paul says. He wrapped it up, and I had you highlight it, verse 13. He says, for in one spirit, how many spirits? One. We are all, if you're a Christ follower, baptized in one body. Jew or Greek, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. There's a lot of oneness in Christ. His church is called to be one around Christ. And what are we? We're a bunch of different people, not rallying around Christ. We're dividing over things that we get a bee in our bonnet over when we read Scripture or when we have an issue in the church. This means if you call yourself a Christ follower, we are drinking from the same well. However... We do not want to drink from the same well sometimes from other professed Christ followers drink from. So I couldn't have a budget to build a well here, but let's just imagine there is a well here. And I go down and I'm drinking from the well and somebody that uh, that really bothers me that has maybe a difference of opinion and we're not seeing eye to eye, he comes down or she comes down and starts drinking out of the same well and I go, oh, what are you doing? Well, I'm drinking of the same well. Ooh, I'm going to go over to this well because I, uh, we're not seeing eye to eye over here. And so we have a thousand different wells because we don't get along. However, Paul's like, wait a second, one spirit, one baptism, one Christ. Why aren't we drinking from the same well? Ah, oh, but man, we like dividing. Well, if we don't agree on the way communion goes, let's separate. If we don't agree on the way baptism goes, let's separate. If we don't agree on certain, certain other little minute things that are secondary issues, let's separate. Let's start our own thing over here. Okay. What does that do for the kingdom of God? That's not growing the kingdom of God. That's shuffling growth. That's transferring godly people to another godly church that thinks and acts and views things their way. That's not biblical. Planting churches, according to God telling us to go and plant, that's healthy. That's what Paul did. He was told to go plant a church in Corinth, to plant a church in Ephesus, to plant a church over here. And what is he doing? He's writing letters back to the church because they took their eyes off of Christ and they started making it about themselves. And so he was trying to help them to stop dividing because then churches split. And he's going, guys, what are you doing? One baptism, one spirit, one Christ. Why do we overcomplicate this? Am I rubbing anyone wrong? Be mad at God. He did that. He created us all different. Guys, we, we drink of the same spirit. And as Scripture tells us, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So where the Spirit of the Lord is, if we are rallying around one Spirit unified together, even in the midst of our differences, we are free. And people will come to know the Lord because of that. So number three under notes, I'll wrap up here pretty quick. Celebrating our differences. Do we celebrate our differences? How can we relate to what Paul is saying here? He says Jew or Greek. Rallying together for unity. Guess what? Jews hated Greeks. Hated Greeks. Like, hated them. And I know hate is a strong word, but that's how much they didn't like the Greeks. However, when they chose Christ, they chose to drink from the same well as the Greek. And the Greek, the same well 
as the Jew. Slave or free. Two separate lifestyles. However, in Christ, they chose to drink from the same spirit. It's a beautiful picture. So where does this come in to one baptism in Christ in our culture? Black or white? Guess what? We all, if we are Christ followers, drink from the same well. Thank you, Lord, it's not a color thing. Asian or Hispanic, guess what? We're all drinking from the same well. Single or married, we're all drinking from the same well. Citizen or undocumented, we are all drinking from the same well when we are Christ followers. Rich or poor, young or old, homeless or not, mentally ill or not, if we are Christ followers, we drink from the same well. Pre, mid, post-trib. If you're a Christ follower in here, you're drinking of the same well. Calvin or Wesleyan, drinking from the same well. Eat meat or not eat meat, public school or private school, TV or no TV. Let's get into the spiritual gifts. Mercy or helps, leadership or tongues, giving or prophecy. If you're a Christ follower, if you're a Christ follower, we're drinking of the same well. We all drink from the same spirit. It's not just these issues that cause trouble in the churches. There are a variety more. Christmas, no Christmas. Halloween, no Halloween. It's the spiritual gifts too. And, and as Stephen was talking about the gifts last week, if I could come full circle with that, it would be like, oh, you have the gifts of helps? Thank you. That's, that's a great gift. Can you go over there and stack chairs, please, because I'm too busy with my gift of tongues over here. Oh, you have the gift of interpretation. Would you mind explaining what that person that just spoke in tongues said as I go over here with my gift of wisdom and deal with it over here? See, we play the disunity game very well as humans in God's church. Those with gifts of helps are all together over here helping. Those with gifts of giving are all over here giving. Those with gifts of leadership are all over here leading. Well, guess what? God designed his church not to function in that way. God designed his church with all these differences, all these different spiritual gifts under one spirit, one baptism, to all work together for his purposes. So you might have a gift of leadership, and you're encouraging all the gifts of helps to go stack chairs. Get your butt over there and start stacking chairs. Like, Can I say that in church? I know that's weird, but it's, it's true. It's too late. Yeah. <laughs> there is no such thing as a spiritual gift of writing me a note because you're mad at what I said. But, but the goal here is that we all work together. We all work together. So I'm not going to ask you to do something I'm not willing to do. And a big, big aspect of our church leadership style is everybody meets on Tuesdays. And we go through what all the other ministries are doing. I'm not saying, oh, because you're working in children's, you're over here. I'm going to only work with the preachers over here. It doesn't work that way. We are all called to get to work for God, not to sit back and to be entertained. He wants us to get to work. So if you view your gift as not a strong gift, guess what? Here at Christ Community, we view it as a strong gift. If you view your gift as only the strongest of gifts, we at Christ Community are going to bring you down a notch. And if you don't like that, there are other churches out there, but we would really love to celebrate unity. But James, I work hard all week. Great. But what is God asking you to do in the service for his kingdom? But James, I, I, I'm not good at those things. Well, good. Either am I. But what is God asking us to do? He's asking us to get the work. But James, I don't want to rob them from an opportunity. <laughs> that is Christianese for an excuse. Okay? Where it's like, oh, well, that's, I don't want to rob them of stacking chairs because I want them to flex their spiritual gift muscle over there. No, God's telling us to get involved, okay? What would it look like if everyone stacked chairs? Wow, it'd move a lot quicker, right? Praise God. What would Paul say if this is what we would play? He'd come up here and he'd write us a really large rebuke letter. And he would do that across the globe to churches. What would Jesus do if Paul wasn't here doing that? Jesus would be like, I'm not even going to come to your church. 
That's even a bigger issue. Do we even see that? That's a problem. Okay, number four in our notes, verses 22 to 26. Notice what he says. I'll, I'll, I'll breeze through these really quick. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which are our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. And there may be no division. What's that word say? Say it louder. One more time. In the body. In the body. No division in the body. But that the members may have the same care for one another. The same care. If one member suffers, guess what? We all suffer. So if you're suffering right now, let us know because we want to help. Because if you're down, we're down. That's what unity is. How do you do it in your family, at home? When one's sick, we rally around, right? When one is down, we rally around. In our, in our family, we do sandwich hugs. Like when one, one of our, our boys or uh, uh, one of the family members are really down, everybody rallies around and squishes the one in the middle, that's down, and we go sandwich loves. I know it's weird, but that's what we do as a family, and we squeeze, and then by the end of it, they're laughing, right? But that's what people do. We rally around each other. Do you think uh, our family of five, or now six, all get along all the time? No. There's no such thing. So there's always going to be some tension. But what do we do? We rally around it, and when one suffers, we all suffer, so we best get unified again, right? So that's the point. Number 500 notes, 28 to 31. Guess what? Here it says, And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping and ministrating in various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. We need everyone. We need everyone. I want to be a church that's different. I really do. I want to be in a church that, that loves the diverseness of, of even some good disagreements. But how we rally around those disagreements and grow from it is how we can actually show Christ's likeness. How do we know this to be true? Because Christ did. When Jesus walked the earth, he picked how many disciples? Twelve. Were they all the same? Did they all look the same? Did they all believe the same things? Did they understand everything? No. Why would he pick them? In our mind, we'd go, oh, I'd probably pick a few different people, especially one, right? But he picked them. Why? Because he was celebrating his kingdom through diversity. And in Christ's likeness, we are baptized by one spirit, one baptism, in one Christ. Let's pray. Glorious Father, you've given us gifts, you've given us talents, you've given us opinions, you've given us ideas, you've given us different interpretations of Scripture, but the one thing remains. You are God. And you sent your Son to free us of our sin. So God, help us to rally around the Spirit of God being baptized in that one Spirit in one Christ. Father, I pray that we could be a church that is unified around the diverseness. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Paul's gentle reminder, yet maybe even a little bit of a stronger rebuke to the church that was divided. God, save us from splitting. Save us from splintering. Save us of divisions. Help us to be mature Christ followers that can come and rally around your scripture and follow your gospel. May we be a church that infiltrates the culture rather than the culture infiltrating our church. In Christ's name, amen.